Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul series in Kerbal Space Program 0.90 Beta. In this episode we're going to start off with transferring this probe over to Jupiter. We're not going to actually reach Jupiter just yet because in between everything going on I want to try the crewed mission to the moon again. And this time I think I'm just going to send one Kerbal honestly. And I think uh, we'll try and make it as spare as possible to reduce complications. I'll see how much I can do that. I haven't built the new system yet. I want to get this done first. I don't know how long it's going to take me to build a new system. Uh, we'll see how much I can get done today. But anyway, uh, I've already plotted the transfer to Jupiter. Now it's going to take us two orbits of Earth to actually finish the transfer, so things are going to change. And so right now we have a plot that brings us to a Ganymede encounter. But again, because we have to go around again, that could change. This involves a 6,200 meters per second initial burn and then a 374 meter per second mid-course correction right there. And it is a plane change. It's uh, flattening us out. Okay, so that is the plan. And uh, now uh, it's the probe up there has its tanks locked. That's why it doesn't seem like we have enough Delta V. In fact, we do. The only Delta V you're seeing is the remnants of this stage and then the RL-10 stage. Okay, but let me line up with the maneuver node and get started and we'll see how things go. Now something I should note, I've uh, decided to try out OpenGL again. If you recall at the very beginning of this series, OpenGL was not working very well for me. Lots of graphical glitches, no anti-aliasing and stuff like that. But it looks like the most recent update to my graphics drivers has made OpenGL work properly. Uh, well, more importantly, uh, uh, various updates to my system made it possible to do a proper installation of the drivers. Uh, this is all very complicated. The point is, I'm using OpenGL right now, and I think it's going to work pretty well. Right now, the memory usage is at 2.4 gigabytes, so that seems good. Alleged rockets ignition. And we have RL10s. Not RL10s, sorry, J2s. Now that we are lined up, I've got to unlock the Aerozine and N204 here so that we can maintain stability once that stage ignites. Though the RL10 should be able to gimbal, of course. Okay, stage separation. Ignition. Okay, looks like we have four RL10s going. Very good. Now we don't have local control anymore. Got a battery down there. Let me double check that this is trained on Earth. Ah, it's not yet. Okay, let's do that. This has its probe core down here. It really should only be drawing electric charge from this one. Can we transfer electric charge? Okay, well that's fine then. I'll just have to remember to transfer the electric charge up when necessary. Alright, uh, here's an update as we have passed the maneuver node. And it really looks like we could possibly go straight through. I mean, it's uh, five minutes left on this stage and then maybe a little bit more on the next bit. But uh, taking a look at our orbit, we've already extended out quite far. And our deviation from the target orbit is not that much. You can see it gets a little bit serious over here. But by that time we'll probably be on escape. Yeah, I don't think it's worthwhile to uh, double back on a 12 hour orbit. We'd have to take that time to come back and everything will have to change. I think we should just go out. This is pretty rare. I mean, normally for even a burn to Mars, I would do two orbits. But I think we're just gonna go straight ahead with this and see what happens. If we have to correct at the mid-course correction and add a little bit more Delta V to that one, that's fine. We'll see how it shapes up. So yeah, I'm just gonna continue on. No, no going around this time. We're just going to continue this burn complete this stage and then burn a little bit of the 
of the upper stage here. I don't know what to call this. This is the transfer stage, but this is actually going to complete the transfer. I guess this is the Jupiter stage. We'll call it the Jupiter stage, because it's going to do most of its delta V burn at Jupiter itself. And then uh, we'll call the top one the, the ex exploration stage, if you will. Whatever that fuel is for. Depends exactly how we meet up with Jupiter. Okay, so about 26 seconds left. I've already transferred the electric charge up, so these batteries are close to being full. At this point, I'm going to use the settling rockets on the stage we're going to discard, because otherwise we won't be using them anyway. So here we go. Okay. Guess we could expense some of the RCS fuel, making sure that it's not being consumed from up here. But I don't want to delay, otherwise we'll deviate from our flight path, so we're already dealing with this sort of gap, about 20 de uh, about 15 degrees, let's say. Okay. Alright. Uh, well, let me turn that off. Separation. Okay. And now I have to unlock these tanks. Forward. Throttle up, and this fuel should be fine. Ignition. Okay. Got 4,000 delta V on this stage, but let's see how the trajectory is shaping out. It's not too far off. Okay, well, we have an encounter. Just gonna take Smart ASS off of the job, and I'm gonna wait until that hits a minimum. We can throttle this engine. This is the lunar module descent engine, so I am going to throttle it. Okay, I think that's as low as that's going to get. Okay, now I'm going to replot that one, and probably, well, let's just quickly see. Let's get into daylight and check our charge, but probably we won't have to worry about our charge at all along the way, but the best place to check would be the mid-course correction. Here we got uh, nine units per second of generation. Drain is just 0.4 right now and as we time warp it goes to 0.25 so that's pretty excellent. Anyway, so let me plot the mid-course plane change and see if we can hit one or the other of Jupiter's moons. Well, we could hit uh, Ganymede on the way in if we didn't mind this particularly close approach to Jupiter. I Actually, I think this is... yeah, I think that's actually uh, a crashing orbit at Jupiter because it doesn't show the periapsis there until here. No, I mean, uh, I don't know. 142 million meters, 142,000 kilometers, is that... would that crash into Jupiter? Anyway, probably not the best thing to do. We've got to be able to hit something elsewhere. Maybe not at the quite the right inclination. Let's see. Oh, wait. There is an IO encounter. How about IO? IO is pretty darn close, though. And it's not going to... Well, none of them are probably going to help us with the capture around Jupiter. How much would a capture around Jupiter take? Can I plot that? Mm, doesn't seem to like to... Let me do that. Unless I do it beforehand. Well, let's see what it is beforehand. Okay, well, that's a capture. How much is that? Oh, it's only 1,100. I think we can swing that. And probably here at periapsis, it'd be even easier. Hmm. So this is doable, actually. Okay, let's get rid of that maneuver. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we, we'll meet up with Io, I think. Do a flyby of Io. Okay. 
and then maybe we'll be able to wait, uh, work our way out from there and try and hit Europa again and meet in Callisto. That's ambitious though, but maybe. Okay, so correction of 383, and let me get the alarm for that. 272 days, so before our launch to Mars. And there is our failed Jupiter probe coming in actually. Okay, so we'll check on our energy situation at that at that correction. Otherwise, I think it'll be fine. And we've got oodles of delta V actually. We've got 5,632 altogether. We're going to use 383 on the mid-course correction. Maybe about 1,200 to get into orbit around Jupiter. Loose orbit only, of course. And then we can see what we can do from there. As long as this portion is in orbit around Jupiter, we're pretty much in business because this is the part that needs to communicate back home. Um, this will communicate back to this for all of its needs. Okay, well, let me go back to the VAB and see what I can do about the crewed landing on the moon. Okay, so let's go through the parts of this mission one by one. This is going to be the return vehicle. And uh, it's quite complicated for a return vehicle, really. I've gone probably a little bit too far. Uh, I think I'm going to end up dropping the utilization on this portion, the service module tanks, to 60%, because we don't need that much Delta V to get back home. Uh, we could do with a little bit more just for maneuvering, but I think it'll be all right. So I'm just checking that out right now. And yeah, I mean, 1,733 is more than enough. We really only need 1,000. But anyway, uh, this upper portion here, uh, well, let me separate it out. So this is what's going to be hitting the atmosphere on the way back. We've got some life support containers up here. Uh, once it hits the atmosphere, it still has 13 days worth of food, water, and oxygen for a single crew member. Parachute up there hopefully should be enough. And uh, yeah. I mean, 2.4 tons. I don't think there's anything too dodgy about this. Maybe I want... No, that's that's pretty pretty good too. The atmosphere reading there is okay. Says everything's successful. Anyway, there are actually two heat shields here. If you recall the last time when we came back from the moon, one of the problems was that we didn't have enough control over the vehicle. Well, this service module has Arizine and N204, and we've added RCS ports here, properly configured. And so we will have control, and then there's a heat shield at the bottom. Now, normally this, this pod already has a heat shield here, and I have not reduced the ability of shielding there. Just in case we want to dump this portion and still use this, the pod has its own RCS system and HTP. I'm just worried that that's not going to be enough. And I don't want to repeat of the fiasco last time where I couldn't orient the vehicle properly. So yeah, and we can do a gentle re-entry pass around the planet and that's because we have all the food, water, and oxygen. We can go around a few times if necessary. So that's part of the plan. Now this this is the rest of this. I mean, I, I'm not going to call this a service module. I'm calling this the maneuvering module. This is the service module. It's got the solar panels. It's got these one kilonewton thrusters mounted on side pods so that we can have the docking port at the bottom to dock with the lander. And in fact, on launch, it'll already be docked with the lander. So that is the configuration there. Plenty of solar panelry, hopefully enough. And that, that, that one scaled up those at that point. Um, plenty of antennae. Don't know what else to say, really. It's got all the stuff. Oh, uh, right. Uh, Agena core. We've got an Agena avionics package here, so that it can be remotely controlled as well. And besides, the command pod doesn't have enough control on its own. It's only got enough for five tons. So the Agena core can manage the rest. Okay, I think that just about says it all. Let's go to the lander and discuss that. Okay, this is the lunar lander. And I don't know about the numbers, honestly. Somehow, uh, just hold on. This is the the tank that's going to bring it back to orbit. It's very small. It's just a 2.9 meter diameter and then 0.3 meter length. That's it. That that tank there. 
Uh, we've got the lunar module descent engine here. Yeah, so we've got the decoupler there, and then these side pods that I got to drop off after landing and starting back up again. So we'll dump the landing legs and these descent portion fuel tanks, but somehow this is enough to get to orbit. I'm still a little bit dubious about that because these contain a lot more fuel altogether. So a bit worried. Uh, the thrust weight ratio is fine. Uh, on landing, uh, we'll start out with 1.9 times the gravitational acceleration of the moon and end up with 5 times. On the way up, it looks like quite a lot, but you have to remember that we can throttle the descent module engine down to a tenth of its full throttle, so we can manage that and make sure that it's a smooth ride up. Delta V-wise, this is obviously more than enough. I'm sort of amazed at how much we've got. I hope it'll be all right. Uh, the control afforded by the by the landing capsule. Where are we? There we are. Lander cam is 20 tons, so that can handle all of this just fine. And I'm gonna replace this docking port with uh, with this one. Initially, I planned this in a different configuration, but now I'm going to dock it right up with the return vehicle on the launch, so we'll have it like that. Okay, that says it all, and uh, Erizine and N204 again all the way down. Okay, here is the full launch on the Shani 2, and it's Shani 2 because we have extended the RL10 stage to 13 minutes and 30 seconds. That's to get to the moon and also to circularized around the moon. The top stack looks like this. Now one thing I didn't mention before about the return vehicle is of course the Kerbal is gonna start out in this capsule and there is no escape system. So yeah that's a little bit dodgy more than a little bit dodgy. I've considered using this Able Delta avionics package in place of the life support tanks in order to test this out. We could potentially do a uncrewed launch but that would be a very expensive test, about 200,000 funds, and we only have 1.4 million. Uh, I think we're just going to have a very, very courageous Kerbal go up there. And that might be the best way to go. There is a lot of redundancy in the system. What there isn't is a lot of thrust to weight ratio. I think I'm going to add a few more struts. You can't go wrong with that, right? Uh, if it'll let me. I want to strut up across this uh, docking port assembly. Okay, well, that'll do j just fine there. Okay, so, yep. Yeah, it's very simple. It's connected to the, the fairing base here. Lander legs, like that. It looks pretty sturdy altogether. We've got solar panels here, solar panels up there. They could all be deployed at the same time to give us a lot of juice. Got commutrons toggling there. Let's get that solar panel here. Okay. And then... Now, trying to put the fairing up to here was doable. You know, uh, just with uh, interstage fairing and having the capsule exposed, but it didn't look great. So I've gone with the whole full fairing, cargo style, even though that's not normal for a crewed mission. Now with the RL-10 stage, the important thing is that we have the Saturn instrumentation unit here. And that's because this is also going to be getting us all the way to the moon and then getting us into orbit around the moon. So we can't just rely on electric charge to uh, supply a guidance unit like these because these take so much, you know, three per second or one per second or two per second. Um, it's much better to take the half per second that the early Saturn instrumentation unit requires. And that's what I'm going with here. It might not be the best staging idea but uh, I think it's safer. Otherwise the rocket is about the same. The main difference is that this stage has been extended. I also snuck uh, one of the guidance unit earlies 
at the top of the first stage and that's to extend our avionics to meet the requirements otherwise we'd be overweight now one other plus side to using OpenGL is that I might be able to launch larger rockets now so that's something I'll look into doing but for now this will be our attempt I'm still mulling about whether to launch it uncrewed or not but I think I'm going to take a risk here and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, who, who do we have that could be courageous enough for this? Um, Renan Kerman. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's tough business. But at least the launcher is reasonably solid, we've tested it before so we can take comfort in that there are other factors that might be dodgy uh, but as you can see maximum thrust to weight ratio never goes above four so it is it is a smooth ride for the Kerbal okay well with that let's go okay here we go a uh, bit of a wobble but we're we're lined up relative inclination is good throttle up SAS is on Still a bit of wiggling that makes me a little bit a bit concerned, but Raynan seems confident. Very well. Ignition. Up. Oh, sorry, made a little mistake there. I had the wrong audio input, so excuse me for that. Anyway, here we go. Uh, Raynan looks a little bit more worried now. Yeah, definitely not a smiley face, that's a frowny face. Well, too late to complain now, Renant. Visually, I think OpenGL is alright, though our frame rates are a little bit low. <laughs> but that's how it is, I guess. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the full supplies for the curl is 54 days. We've got extra supplies on the service module. The lander has, I think, two to three days worth. Okay, five seconds to boost the separation. We're holding a 50 degree pitch. Raynand is a little bit calmer now. Hopefully we'll get some of our frame rates back once we dump the boosters. Okay, booster set. Okay, we have gone from 2 frames per second to 5 frames per second, so yes, we have reclaimed some frame rates. And hopefully once those get out of render range, uh, we'll get some, some more back, too. Okay, 3 minutes and about 10 seconds before this stage runs out. Okay, so I just had to take Smart ASS off because it was producing some serious oscillation. It was over-gimbling the engine quite a lot. Possibly the command pod up there was wiggling a bit, causing Smart ASS to compensate. Interesting that SAS never seems to have, well, not never, but in this case does not seem to have this problem. We're not at a particu particularly high thrust to weight ratio, we're at 1.6 right now, so that wasn't the problem. Anyway, we've got uh, 43 seconds left in this stage. And then we'll have a five and a half minute J2 stage to work with before Raynan gets to orbit. It's gotta be a bit of a high orbit. That's uh, in keeping with the Shawnee's launch profile so far. I don't know if the J2 stage will get us all the way to orbit or if we'll have to burn some of the RL10 stage, but we only expect three burns of the RL10 stage, maybe four. At most we're doing uh, complete the orbit 
transfer to the moon, a mid-course adjustment of some kind, and then a burn to make orbit around the moon. So, and that's well within the 10 RL-10 ignitions that we could possibly have. Okay, four seconds. Oh, where are our fairings? Oh, that's, that's our fairings, actually. Let's have those in a separate stage. Eek. Wrong timing. Okay, set. Let's try that again. Okay, J2s have ignited. And fairing separation. Okay. Let's try Smart ASS again. Maybe it'll be alright. Okay, so we have passed Apoapsis and we are now going down, but Raynan seems happy enough, so should be alright. But uh, actually, our Delta V situation is a bit tight. I'm not entirely sure how it's gonna be on the lunar side of things. We could transfer to the moon, it's just a matter of um, how much orbit we'll take. I'm not worried about getting into orbit around Earth, that's fine, we still have plenty of time for that. Okay, we're about to start going up again, which is good, but we need about 400 meters per second out of the third stage just to get to orbit, which is bad. That's, that's a fair summary of the situation right there. Can guy ignite the, the Ullet rockets on this stage so that we can use them. Okay. All right, separation and ignition. Well, four thousand two hundred and seventy-two meters per second. That's not bad. It's not bad. Take 400 out of that or so, let's say 3,800 meters per second, we need 3,100 to get to the moon, at least 700 to get into orbit around the moon. Normally I'd plan for 800, so it's not too far off, but it's still sort of off. Anyway, let's get the solar panels out. Oh, that, that was the antennae solar panels. And I didn't action group these. Okay, let's extend the panels here. Probably these solar panels are a little bit big for that lander stage. Yeah, considering there's 43,000 electric charge there, maybe I shouldn't have put the solar panels on that at all. Got to retract them, they just look a little bit weird. So I forget if I've mentioned it, but of course Rainand is going to have to EVA in order to get to the lander. I, mean, I suppose we could try and transfer him through the docking port, but that's not really realistic anyway. And since the lander is the one with uh, 20 tons worth of control, it's going to have to transfer there before this stage decouples, I think. Because right now this has local control. His capsule only has 5 tons, the Agena only has 12 tons, so you combine those, those are 17 tons, that's not enough to control this whole thing. Don't know how it works out, whether, but I, I suppose that's probably safer, just to transfer him to the lander can before separating this off. Okay, that's good enough. 282 by 210, and that's a fine orbit. Actually, uh, maybe I miscalculated. We might actually have enough to fulfill my normal plans, 3,100 to get to the moon and 800 to make orbit. Yeah. Okay, very good. Alright, Raynand is happy and I guess we are we are on the road to a potential lunar landing.
But you'll have to tune in next time to see whether we make it or not, whether Raynan come back, comes back home safe. I'll save that for the next episode because I'm out of time. So with this mission as it is in orbit around the Earth, I'll say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.